I'm here with uh, James uh, Al Tucker. Hello, James. Scott, thank you so much for. I've been such a fan of yours um, um, and your enthusiasm for chess on every video. So I'm, I, I can't believe I'm sitting here talking to you. I, I'm actually uh, honored that uh, you know I've been able to get you and speak to you because the number of things you have achieved is so huge. You are an author. You are a fund manager. You are a stand-up comedian. You are an investor. You are an entrepreneur. You are, and now you are a budding uh, sort of chess improver. Like you want to improve at chess. So a lot of things there. Yeah, but you know, and I'm curious your opinion. Could it be jack of all trades, master of none? You know, that's what I worry about. If, if I spread too thinly, but you have to do what you're passionate about. Don't do something you're not passionate about. But, but it's so important for me to squeeze out as much enjoyment as I can, because we know we're here for a finite amount of time. Right. And, you know, it doesn't mean go off and do whatever. I have responsibilities, but I've been particularly passionate. I mean, I was passionate about chess when I was younger. I hit 2200 when I was younger, and, and now 25, I stopped for 25 years, and now I just want to be as good as I was then. And it's hard. It's the hardest thing. This is harder than just about anything else I've ever done. Right. I think right now you've uh, come down to 1,850 around ELO. Well, USCF, I'm between 2,000 and 2,200. Okay. So I never had a fee. Back in the 90s in the U.S., there was no fee day ratings. Ah. So I'm just trying to get back to like 2,250 USCF. Wherever that takes me fee day is okay. Okay. Got it. So right now your journey revolves a lot around improvement at chess and uh, I think there's a very interesting domain in chess that's developing a lot of people are talking about it which is adult improvement you yeah. know how adults improve at chess um, what are you doing right now for your chess that could be actually uh, some kind of uh, kind of a plan for someone else as well but what do you follow you know there is a plan and it evolves because as you improve and as you gain certain knowledge, you realize, oh, now there's this other thing I need to do. So, and that comes up a lot. But initially, I always start with what I call my plus minus equal. So a plus, you find someone who's much better than you, who can be like your coach or depending on what it is you're doing, whether it's investing or playing a sport or playing chess, you find someone who's your plus, someone who could teach and mentor and coach. Then there's the, the minus. It's always good for you to find someone to coach. Even if you're not so good, you need to find someone to coach because even Einstein said, if you can't explain something simply, then it means you don't really understand it. So I always have to make sure I'm really truly understanding these principles that I'm learning. Nice. And then there's the concept of an equals, which is you have who are the people you know, you're in tournaments with, are you comparing notes, are you exchanging ideas, because they're on their paths to improvement, and it's good to compare, to be frenemies, even with the people you compete with. Mm -hmm. And so, so that was the first step for me, was finding coaches. And even since I started this process of two years ago, I've had several coaches, uh, and now I'm working with uh, Avatik Rigorian, who you know at, at chessmood.com. Yes. Very guy, a very good guy who Wonderful thinks... Wonderful person. Yeah. Very positive always. Very positive. And then that's what I realized too, is that it's, it's not just about the micro skills of chess. So first let me explain that. Whenever I learn anything, let's say when I was learning investing, or let's say when I was learning even stand-up comedy, there's no such skill as investing. There's micro skills. Uh, you break a, a, what seems like a skill into its into its micro components. So like with investing, you need to know about money management. You need to know about risk tolerance. You need to know about the psychology of investing. You need to know how to study a, a company's balance sheet and, and what style of investor are you and value investing, growth investing, and all sorts of types of investing. With comedy, you need to know not only how to write a joke, but how to work with the crowd, how to uh, you know work with the mic, do stage work, how to... Um, how to make voice funny voices. Like there's so many micro skills that no one really teaches you. You have to study these things. 
And with chess, of course, there's openings, there's end games, there's middle games, there's tactics, there's puzzles, there's what to do in a space advantage, what to do with a bishop pair. You could break down the micro skills even further. But then what I realized, particularly since 25 years ago, I was younger, now I'm older, the brain has changed. And so there's things like sleep and exercise and nutrition and understanding the neuroscience of how a brain changes from the age of 25 to 50 or 30 to 55. The brain changes quite a bit. And understanding how the brain changes so you can study accordingly is very, very important. And so I've spent a lot of time on that as well. Those were, and those were micro skills I did not expect to encounter. Ah. So you are now working on many of the micro skills at chess, um, which like, let's say I, I would consider like tactical ability, positional uh, sense. Yeah. Uh, all of these would come under micro skills, yes? Yes, and even those are very broad ah. skills. Okay. Like positional, you know, when, uh, when for everybody who's younger, you calculate better. Your tactics are just naturally better when you're younger. Your ability to focus is better when you're younger. You have more stamina when you're younger. So when I was younger, I feel like I didn't need to know as much positional things. Like, okay, I would know, I had an open, you know, I knew my openings because you have a good memory when you're younger. You lose, you lose memory as you age. After like the age of 35 or so, every year it's a little harder to retain things. And so, okay, I knew my openings and I knew I was tactically good enough to be whatever rating I was in 1997. And, uh, but you lose those things. But I didn't need to know what to do when I had a space advantage or what, I didn't, I, I literally did not know to open the position when I have a bishop pair. Like these things I've had to learn, you know, now because the other things I lose. The tactics, not as good. Memory, not as good. Not horrible, but just there's a difference. Right. Now I have to actually know what chess is. <laughs> so now, now you're learning everything. And what is very impressive is the fact that you've been so successful at many of the things you've done. Like, right, like your books have been like bestsellers. Yes. You also sold your business um, for millions of dollars, you know. So you could have actually done stuff which you're already good at and where you have already succeeded. What kind of motivates you to go into this space where you're now back to sort of the learning uh, space and where you're facing um, tough time, you know, you're not getting the results you desire and so on. Yeah, I mean, there's this concept. So first off, I'm, I'm a writer from all the way, as long as I've been playing chess, I've been also writing and I've written over 20 books. So as I started down this journey, I decided, okay, I'm going to write a book. It'll take me six months to get back to my, the rating I want to be and then I'll write about it. Of course, it's been a year and a half, almost two years later, and you know it, it's been a very interesting journey. But there's this idea, there's this bigger picture, which is the idea of a quest. And what you go on a quest because you think something, maybe there's an object you want to get, or some goal you want to achieve, or some place in life where you would like to be. And so you set this quest for yourself. In in literature, you know, King Arthur famously at a quest for the, the Holy Grail. And uh, uh, he never found it, his knights never found it, but along the way they go on adventures and they, ha they have so many adventures while they're on this journey. And I've noticed for myself with every quest I have throughout my life, whether it's, oh, build this business or invest or try stand-up comedy or write this book, there's always adventures that happen just magically along the way if you're really passionate about the quest. So look where we are right now. We're in Amsterdam and we watched a tournament of 10 of the top players in history. Like it's a magical thing. And this, and you know, we were invited to come out here. You know, there's an organizer, Ilya Levitov, who organized this. We've all been invited to observe this tournament. And I never would have, you know, been here if I wasn't really passionate about pursuing this quest, and then I started writing for New and Chess, so my name got out there a little bit. And just along the way, 
I have many, many experiences like this now mm. in the chess world, a world that I had completely left in 1997. Right. But just the pursuit itself, I don't want to say it's the journey that it's important and not the goal, because the goal is very important. Without being passionate about the goal, you can't have the journey. If the goal is like something you don't really care about, you, you're not going to you're not going to have a fun journey. It's not going to be pleasant. If, if my goal was to be, I don't know, l learn five different languages, it would be a very miserable journey for me because <laughs> I'm not good with languages. But, but I've had so many interesting experiences and met fascinating people all along the way in the past two years. It's been unbelievable to me. Even if that quest were to stop today, which it's not, I would say this was a, a, an amazing experience. That's the joy of improvement, is not just improving, but everything that happens along the way. Like, I wanted to improve my memory. I took lessons from the world memory champion. I wanted to understand, you know, mindset and, and its effect on my games. I've talked to sports psychologists. I've talked to brain scientists. Uh, I've learned all about the, the neuroscience of, of aging. Like, did you know, for instance, the peak age for a mathematician is 25? Guess what the peak age for a historian is? <laughs> well, it should be much older, right? Because you have to gain so much knowledge there. Yeah. So, so, so I would put it like 50, maybe? 69 years old. Whoa. And the reason is, is because what we were talking about earlier, some parts of, you know, like calculating and sharpness and memory, they might go down. But things like wisdom, however, whatever word you want to use, pattern recognition, intuition, those go up. So historians, for instance, have to say, oh, this thing that's happening in this country right now is sort of like what happened in 1850 in this other country. So they, are, they have the experience and the ability to sew together these patterns and create new wisdom for themselves. And that's in, true in general about the brain. And so as you get older, if you're learning, some, if you're trying to improve at something like chess, of course tactics are important, of course memorizing and openings are important, but you also have to really understand, you know, the, the, the patterns and intuition and philosophy of different positions that has built up over the hundreds of years of, of chess playing. It's amazing, you know, and also I think you are comfortable with this sort of uncertainty, right? You don't know the answer. You are actually on the quest to find it. And uh, you will get it because there are so many people who say different things, right? There are, there are all people have reached that Stay, uh, level through different means yeah uh, and it's not easy like if someone were to come to you for financial advice you would give them something and another financial expert would give some other advice and so on and a person could get quite uh, confused and I guess for any chess improver that also happens when he talks to a lot of people you know it's a really good point like anything worth learning and obviously I think chess is really worth learning for a lot of reasons anything worth learning there's really no answer on how to improve. Like if I were to ask all the players who played in this tournament how to improve, nobody would have the same answer, and any answer they had would be incorrect. Because, <laughs> you know, I, I, Simon Agdestein, who was here for a little bit, might have put it best, just do whatever, and if you love it, you'll improve. Mm. That might be a bit broad, and again, sometimes these players are so good they don't even know how it was that they became the best in the world, True. you know, so quickly. But, uh, you know, so it is, anything worthwhile is going to be difficult. And, and the thing is, it's going to be disappointing. So it's not about, it, it's, an, it's an interesting thing. It's not necessarily about happiness, but about are you content with what you're doing? Like, you know, have you found, are you improving? Or have you found community around it? Does it give you a sense of freedom to do this? Like if you feel like you have to do it, then that's not fun and won't lead to contentment. So these are all important on the path to improvement. But happiness is not necessarily part of the equation because you're going to get disappointed a lot. Like chess, chances are you're going to lose approximately 50% of your games if you're playing someone equally rated to you. Right. So that's, you know, the struggle is part of the, the journey. And, and the psychology of that struggle, whether you're investing when you, sometimes when I invest, I lose money. Sometimes when I write a book, it doesn't sell well. Sometimes when I start a business, it fails. I've, I've gone broke many times and had to come back from extreme disappointment. Sometimes when I was doing comedy, 
uh, even right here in the Netherlands, nobody would laugh. <laughs> so, you know, you have, to, you have to learn how to surf that wave because it's a rough wave no matter what. Unless we were interested in bird watching. I think people who do bird watching are very happy. Like, they just write down what birds they saw today. That's, that's got to be relaxing. But I'm not interested in that. True, true. It's very, uh, very wise words and very wise advice which you have given in terms of how to have the right philosophy and mindset while going for improvement. Um, if we come to specifics of your, what you are doing, if sure. you had to recommend like 10 things that you are doing right now, uh, it could be reading a book, watching a video series, watching, uh, you know, solving something somewhere. Uh, what are the top 10 things that sure. you would recommend? And, and I'll recommend them, but they might, they might not be the correct things. Sure. But, you know, they I work listen. for you or at least you are doing them right now. They may change at yeah. some point. And look, I watch as my online rating has improved and, you know, I can see what works and what doesn't. Um, but for everybody, it's different. And like we just were saying, there might not be one real correct Absolutely. answer. It's just you have to be passionate about it and then you'll you'll absorb more from every activity you're doing the more passion you have. But definitely tactics every day and a combination of like fast tactics, like two, three move tactics and more serious calculation problems. Uh, I go over a lot of, I, so for my openings, again, because my memory With is a little- these tactics, where do you solve? Uh, I'll do everything from uh, uh, like Puzzle Rush on chess.com to the lead chess problems, which are more complicated. It takes a little bit more time to the woodpecker method to on chessmood.com. There's various tactics tests. And, you know, whenever, whenever I see, I have some apps, CT, CT scan, I think it's called, uh, or, or CT. CT art. CT art, yeah. And, art of uh, chess tactics. Yeah, I, I go through that every day. And so, th so I probably do about an hour's worth of tactics a day. And then probably an hour or so worth of openings a day. But that I'm unsure is the, all the positive benefits. Like, because I see many people who know their openings great, but you know, you don't, after like 10 moves, you're usually not in an opening that you know and you have to fend for yourself. So much more important to understand, you know, I, I, I go through maybe an hour or so of classic games and, and video courses, uh, particularly ones that, you know, so Avatik Gregorian's my chess coach and he recommends videos I look at. It might be on a video or a, video or a course or a game on that ex exemplifies some attacking lesson or here's the bishop pair lesson or here's, you know, what to do with, you know, any, you know open files. And then I'll do some practical end game studying and then technical end game studying. So what do you do with a rook versus rook and a bishop pawn and a rook pawn? That's like a technical end game. And then there's practical end games like, oh, let's go through Rubenstein's end game games and just get the feel for how he played. And I have to go through things several times sometimes because again, mem memory, which I always was good at and I still feel I'm good at is not the same as it was. So I could feel it. I could feel the difference in between now and 25 years ago. Right. And these end game things which you said, uh, do you use chess mood for it or is there any other? Yeah, uh, chess mood, but also books. Like I really enjoy Boris Gelfin's books. Uh, a lot of it has to do with practical end games. And there's a book that just came out uh, by Magnus Carlsen and David Howell called mm -hmm. Grind Like a Grandmaster. Beautiful book. Did you, did you already read it? I'm about one third of the way through. Wow. It's a beautiful book, actually, because they're discussing their own problems. They, they have a very good style in writing it. Like they discuss their own problems as they were growing up, in, as Magnus was growing up in scale and David as well, and how they learned how to play these equalish positions. So it's, it's very good. And uh, yeah, so those are really the, the main thing. And then I play. Mm. So I'll play, I'll analyze and annotate each game, even blitz games that I play. And then um, once a week I go over those games with my coach. So, and, he'll, and so, cause I usually have questions over like, why was this wrong and why was this right? Where did I go wrong here? I felt like I had a good position. What did I do wrong? And he encourages me not to use the computer, 
which is, you know, it's very easy to get addicted to like, but I have to know the right answer. In the computer, you think always has the right answer, but sometimes it's still okay how you played, even if you didn't do the exact computer line. So it's good to just, you know, sometimes those lines are too obscure for humans. So you have to, you just have to have a good reason why you did something and, and, and so on. And how important do you think is playing tournaments? Very important. Because when you sit there and playing, let's say you're playing uh, two hours each side or an hour and a half each side. That's, you know, you're, you, you get to take a position or a series of positions and really try to understand what is deeply happening so that, so that you could come up with a plan. And your opponent is doing the same thing. So you have to understand this position deeper than your opponent or else you won't win. And, and at the same time, you have to keep your stamina up. So if you're playing someone younger, they have more stamina, so you have to learn how to keep your stamina up. You have to learn how to not blunder. In blitz games, we all blunder, but in classical games, we blunder too, but it's very important to avoid them. It's even more important to avoid them there because it's just one game you're playing. And uh, I think, I, and then analyzing a tournament game is different than analyzing a blitz game because again, you're trying to find all the ideas in a position and then pick the best one. In a blitz game, there's time to come up with, blitz is good because I think you practice your intuition. There's no time to calculate. So you, you practice an intuition of where do the pieces go in this type of position. Of course, it's important in classical, but there's a lot more to think about in a classical game. There's many squares the pieces could go, and you have to decide what are the best. In Blitz, you're just practicing the intuition, so you don't have to think of too many squares. You just put your pieces in what intuitively seems like the best. Very interesting, yeah. And I think uh, you are doing this every day, right? You're spending five to six hours almost each day. Shh, I'm trying not to let my wife know. It's more like 10 hours on some days, but she won't watch this video, so I'm okay. <laughs> Unless she gets hooked to chess and someday she starts to search how to improve at chess and your video comes up. <laughs> she will not be interested in chess, I can guarantee it. <laughs> so, but it's such an exciting thing for me to return to this activity that I loved when I was younger. And now after all these different life experiences that have happened in between, can I apply what I learned about learning to this, new, this field that, I, that I've always loved? And it's, again, very exciting. I want to ask you a final question before we end this. Uh, you know, a lot of people say that, uh, you know, you can do a lot of things that impact the world. And you've done so many of that, right? You've, you've invested in companies, you've built stuff, you, you've written books which help people. But chess as an endeavor, is not contributing much to the society. That's what is the uh, point of view of some people. It's not that I feel so. So what is your take on this thing as a person who's done many things and is now doing chess? I, it's a very interesting question because a lot of people think that, oh, is this a frivolous activity? Meanwhile, I mean, I have a podcast and I've interviewed football players, basketball players, musicians, artists, if you're a famous basketball player in the US, all you're doing is running back and forth and throwing a ball into a, a net. How is that a, a, a worthwhile activity? And yet it is, I'm not criticizing it. First off, you can make a good living. So a lot of people define worthwhile as making a living. So a lot of people who play sports make a great living in a, in a respected sport. In chess, you know, it's not, the case that there's not a huge number of people making a, a great living from it. But anything which challenges your mind, challenges your body to improve. Again, in order to get better at chess, I had to understand the role of nutrition, the role of exercise, the role of aging and cognitive decline. And uh, I had to really put my memory to the test. I have to learn about learning. So, you know, the things you learn while learning chess, you could apply to other areas. And, and I have, like, because well, I, again, I hit 2200 when I was younger, and th that stayed with me, that ability to learn when I went into investing, when I went into running a business, when I went into podcasting or writing or, or even stand-up comedy. 
it's almost like learning a third or fourth language because I already put in the years initially studying chess. Uh, and so that in itself is worthwhile. Second thing is, there's such a wonderful community in chess. I remember one time I went down to Buenos Aires visiting somebody and they have one of the most famous chess clubs in the world. I knock on the door, they answer, they don't speak English at all. And so my friend said, you know, oh, he's rated chess player, is this rating in the US? And they're like, oh, come right in. The chess club had been closed. They showed me where, you know, Petrosian had played Fisher, uh, Capablanca had played Alekhine, and then they sat down, a few people were there, they played me. And so you have community all over the world. And I find that's the essence of a quest too, is that you build community and you find your community of, of good people who are passionately interested in, in what you are. So when I was doing comedy, there's a, there's a whole culture and community around that. When I'm doing investing, there's a whole culture and community around that. Everything you do, you know, they say that you're the average of the five people you spend most of your time with. And in every interest and culture and community, you'll find those five people and hopefully you gravitate to the good people and that's how you improve and get better and, and find that contentment that a quest should provide. Beautifully put. Well, Thank you. very nicely said, James, and it was a pleasure meeting you here. The uh, pleasure is all mine. Uh, you don't know how many impressions I, of you I do in my home, so <laughs> my kids are sick of me doing it. <laughs> Magnus Carlson. I won't do it here. <laughs> no, you could, you could. <laughs> no, no, it's, but it's, I practiced you. Thank you. And it was a pleasure meeting you, knowing your journey, and I think it's, uh, it would be amazing if you continue this quest and, uh, well, if you reach your goal, uh, that would be epic. It will inspire so many others. I think it will be too because I think, again, a quest is worthwhile in and of itself, but then actually achieving the goals of the quest really start to unlock how improvement happens. But I do want to, can I make a reference to Hinduism? Yes. So, you know, the, the Mahabharata, does it matter, does it matter if Arjuna wins the battle or not, according to Krishna. It doesn't really matter. He just needs to do it. He stops in the middle and he doesn't want to do it. And his charioteer, the guy just riding his, the horses, becomes God and, and explains why it's important to continue. Not that he win, just continue. On that note, beautifully said. Thanks, James. Thank you.